All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Um, and let's get started. So I would like to talk about how to write very fast C-sharp code. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of tips and tricks to speed up your C-sharp code. And we're going to do lots of benchmarks to uh, find out um, what kind of code is slow in C-sharp, what kind of code is fast, and where the, the, the pitfalls are. Um, before we get started, there's a couple of um, offers that I'd like to bring to your attention. Um, first of all, I have 10 courses on Udemy about C-sharp programming. If you're interested, um, I've got a coupon code called PostSharp15 that'll get you a 90% discount on any of my Udemy courses. Um, I've also uh, copied all my courses to Teachable, to my own Teachable environment, and there um, I have um, a subscription model where you can get access to any course for $9 per month, and um, future courses are included. So if you're in the subscription, any new course that I produce, uh, you'll automatically get access. And I produce a course roughly once a month, uh, once every two months if I have a slow month. Um, so um, you can expect new content every month. Um, last but not least, the source code that I'm using in this webinar, um, I will send it to you if you send me an email. So just email me at the email address uh, at the bottom here and I will reply with a zip file of the solution and you can play around with this actual code and do some benchmark testing of your own. Um, okay, let's get started. So these are the topics I want to cover uh, in this webinar. I'm going to show you um, the overhead of throwing an exception. I'm going to show you how to manipulate strings, so how to handle strings in C Sharp. Um, I'm going to take a look at arrays, at the different types of arrays in C Sharp and how they match up in terms of performance. I'll show you the difference between a for and a for each loop and what that does to your performance. I'll show you structs versus classes. So, um, I mean, you probably know that structs are slightly faster than classes, but how big is the difference? And is it worth the trouble of refactoring your code? I'll show you how to copy a block of memory using different techniques. And um, I'm saving the best for last. At the end, um, I'm going to show you how to instantiate classes and how to do basic reflection in an extremely fast manner. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you a piece of code that emits custom uh, SIL instructions. So we're basically uh, compiling C-sharp on the fly, creating a custom assembly to do super fast reflection. So let's get started. Um, I'm using Visual Studio Community Edition um, to run this code on OS X. Um, I've written a console program to do the performance measurements and um, I'm using a base class called performance test right here to run the performance, uh, the different performance tests. Um, I have three method, methods here, measure test A, measure test B, and measure test C. So these are virtual methods, and in um, any derived class, I will put the test code in here. And the format is always that the, the first one, test A, is the baseline test. So this would be unmodified, uh, slow code. And then we have two methods, B and C, available to try out different kinds of optimizations. And then for the actual performance test down here, um, the performance test is fairly simple. Basically what I do is um, I go through these test A, test B, and test C methods, and I repeat them a number of times. So you can see there's a constant here, default repetitions, with a value of 10. Um, I basically repeat the test 10 times to average out the effects of the garbage collector, um, because you know an ill-timed collection of the garbage collector can really slow down one of the tests. So if we just run it 10 times, then we average out that effect. To measure performance, um, you're supposed to use the stopwatch class in C Sharp. So when you're doing benchmarking, please don't use date time. Uh, always use stopwatch because uh, stopwatch is a specialized class for uh, measuring time spans extremely accurately. So you can see I always start by um, restarting a stopwatch, um, doing the test, stopping the stopwatch, and then um, I have the elapsed milliseconds right here, and I'm adding that to a variable. And then in the end, you can see right here, I'm returning that total value divided by the number of repetitions. 
So we're doing 10 repetitions. So, you know, uh, we have the total elapsed time for every method and then um, divided by the number of repetitions gives you the average execution time. So um, let's get started. I have the program running right here. Um, so it's a console program with eight tests uh, pre-configured and I can simply select a test and run it. So you can see the first one is exceptions. Let me go, go back to the code. I'll show you the code. So the exception test is right here. So you can see it's, it's just a class that derives from performance tests. So I get to implement these measure A and measure B methods. Um, so what I'm doing Check this out here in the constructor. What I'm doing is I'm filling a list um, of 1,000 strings. So I've got a, a list of strings, 1,000 strings, and every element in the list is a number. Um, the number has five digits, so I pick them from this list at random, and you can see I have an X here at the end. So what this code does is it mixes digits together to create random numbers, and one in 11 digits um, is going to be an X, which will make any number invalid. So 9% um, of my list element population is going to be invalid and won't be able to be parsed. So what does my test do? Uh, you can see right here, test A does a simple int.parse and catches any format exception. And test B does int.tryparse. And that's basically the only difference. So let me run the code and we can see what happens. So I'm running test zero, uh, 100 iterations, and I include the baseline. So here we go. So now it's doing the test and then doing it 10 times to average out any effects. Uh, and it will show us the results in a little graph uh, when it's done. Here you go. So you can see that the um, slowdown of um, an exception in Intel parse is massive. You can see we're looking at an execution time of 1.094 seconds for the parse function, and the try parse is 9 milliseconds. So this is a massive difference in performance. And uh, keep in mind, only 9% of the numbers were invalid. So if you have a much higher uh, failure rate in your data, much higher number of invalid uh, um, fields in your data, um, exceptions are really going to slow down your code. So the takeaway here is um, don't um, swallow exceptions in your code. Don't catch an exception and don't do anything with it. Um, if you're parsing a lot of data, um, make sure that you validate the data before you try to parse it and don't do it the other way around where you first parse the data and then catch the exception and then in the catch block um, you know you you recover your code I mean you can do that but it will really slow down the execution of your code exceptions are super slow they take um, roughly one microsecond to execute um, and I mean it's incredibly slow and that's because they're intended for debugging purposes they do uh, they capture the stack trace they capture the context of the executing thread and they prepare all this debug information so uh, they're not they're not supposed to be thrown in mission critical loops in your code so first takeaway um, don't catch exceptions um, avoid exception throwing as much as you can in mission critical code Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at is uh, string handling. So this is a classic example of c -sharp performance optimization. And yet I am, I'm surprised by the number of people who, um, who don't realize this crucial difference. Um, this is the code that does the test. The first, uh, the baseline test, simply builds a string. So we start with an empty string right here, and then in a simple loop, um, I add one character to the string. And I do that 50,000 times. So in the end, I have a string of 50,000 characters, so that's uh, 100 kilobytes on the heap. Um, and that's it. The B test does the exact same thing, but it uses a string builder. So instead of adding strings together, it uses a string builder, and it uses the append method to append the character. Um, the third test um, does builds up a string incrementally and it uses pointers. So you can see here that I, I start with a character array of 50,000 characters. Then I fix that character array on the heap and I ask for a um, pointer to that block of memory. 
Um, then I declare my own pointer and initialize it with this initial value. So um, the pointer will initially point to the first element in the character array. And then in a simple loop, I use the pointer to directly write this character into heap memory. So this is a very interesting test because it will show us how much faster string builder is uh, compared to a regular string. And if it's worth your while to use pointers instead of using the string builder um, to speed up your code even more. So let's do the test and see what happens. So I'm running test one, the string test, 50,000 iterations with a baseline. And here we go. Dun, dun, dun. And there you have it. So 553 milliseconds for the string. And the other two tests, they actually did run, but they are so fast that we can't see them on this resolution. Um, so. I mean, you're getting a hint already eh, that the difference in performance is massive here. So let me run the test again. So now I'm going to go to 1 million iterations. And now I have to disable the baseline test because then otherwise we have to wait forever. And check this out. The string builder um, takes two milliseconds and the pointer operation is now so fast that we can't see it. So I'll do this again. Um, and now I'm gonna do 100 million iterations, again, without the baseline test. Let's wait for it. And here are the results. 452 milliseconds for this string builder and 169 milliseconds for the pointer. So there is this massive performance difference between using strings and using the string builder. And if you want ultimate performance, you can use direct pointer operations on the heap and that'll get you a threefold, roughly threefold performance uh, boost over using string builders. So if you're wondering why is the string so incredibly slow, um, it's because of this. I, let me show it to you in a picture. Um, when you append characters to a string, uh, strings are immutable in .NET. So that means that any operation that modifies the string will create an entirely new string on the heap. So in the first loop iteration, we have an empty string, and then um, I add one character, so I get a string of a single character on the heap. Then I add another character, and now I have two strings on the heap, the original and the modified version. Then I had a third character, and now I have three strings on the heap the original, the modified version, and again, the modified version, and so on and so on. So if I add 50,000 characters to a string, I end up with 50,000 um, disposed strings on the heap, where each string is one character longer than the string before it. So it's a huge amount of data that I'm, I'm, I'm flooding the heap with data, and I'm constantly doing this memory copy operation where the string is being copied to a new version and to a new version and to a new version. So once we hit the, the, the higher end of the loop, uh, like the high loop iterations, we're copying this block of 100 kilobytes uh, on the heap. Uh, it's like 100K and then 100K plus one byte and then 100K plus two bytes and so on and so on. So it's super inefficient. If you use a string builder, it works the way you would expect. You have this buffer in memory that can hold any number of characters. You can declare a string builder and specify the size. And then you simply write characters into specific locations in that buffer of memory. So naturally, the string builder is much, much faster. Now, the, the fun part is that the string builder behind the scenes, the string builder is actually using this code. So internally, the string builder fixes a block of memory and then writes directly to that memory using character pointers. And the only reason why we see a difference between these two blocks of code is because in test B, we have the overhead of the append method, and that will slow down the code a bit. So going back to the results, uh, oops, going back to the results, um, the string builder, when you're modifying strings, always use a string builder because it's, it's way faster. I mean, 50,000 iterations for the string and 100 million iterations for the string builder. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But if you want ultimate performance, use pointers directly. That'll give you another threefold improvement over the string builder. Okay, moving on to arrays. Let me show you the array test. Um, I have a very simple uh, piece of code. I declare a three-dimensional array. So I have an array with uh, three dimensions, then I have three nested for loops to fill the array, and 
in the innermost loop, all I do is um, increment every array element by one. So super simple. So that's test A. Test B um, uses a one-dimensional array and it's flattened. So um, I have a one-dimensional array that has the same size as the, th the three-dimensional array. And I use this, this simple formula to calculate the index into this one-dimensional array using the i, j, and k variables. And then I do the same operation. Finally, I uh, have a one-dimensional array. I use i, j, and k. But now you can see I simply have an index variable that starts at zero and I increment it by one. So instead of using this, this formula with the multiplication and the addition, I just have a simple variable that incrementally goes through the entire array and initializes it. So let's take a look at the performance of these arrays. So I'm running test two, 300 iterations with a baseline. Here we go. And here's the result. The three-dimensional array is slowest. The flattened one-dimensional array is faster. And the uh, array with incremental uh, access is the fastest. Now, you might be wondering right now, uh, what's going on? How, why is a three-dimensional array slower than a one-dimensional array with the exact same logic? I mean, if you think about it, this, this, this expression, the .NET framework needs to do this exact same calculation to find the memory location of this threefold array index. So either I'm doing the formula or the framework is doing the formula, but it's the same mathematical expression. So why do we see this difference? So to explain that, I'm going to have to show you the intermediate language code of this uh, compiled program, which I have right here. So let's uh, go to the array test. Uh, oops, sorry, arrays test, plural. Um, so here it is. Here's the, the array test class. Um, this is the constructor. Let me just scroll down. And this is measure test A. So the code to access the array element is right here. So you can see these, uh, this instruction uh, loads a location, uh, loads a local variable um, of the stack. So uh, 0, 1, and 2 are the i, j, and k variables. And then this call does the array indexing. And you can see it's, it's actually a method call. It's an instance call to the array class. And within that class, it calls a method called address, which expects three parameters. So behind the scenes, the .NET framework implements a three-dimensional array as a class. And any interaction with that class goes through methods. But now let's look at the one-dimensional array. So that's right here. Um, and the operations are here. So this is the code to index into a one-dimensional array. And the thing you, I want you to notice is this instruction here called load element address. Load element address indexes into a one-dimensional array and returns the address of that element. So to work with one-dimensional arrays, the uh, .NET framework, the .NET runtime, has a specialized SIL instruction. So load element is optimized, is specialized to work with one-dimensional arrays. So there's no, no method call. Uh, I don't have to go into a method and run some .NET framework code to get at the um, array element. Um, it can all be done with SIL instructions. The only method calls in this, this block of code are these two. And they are only needed because my array dimensions are stored in this property. If I had used an array with a constant dimension, a constant size, this call wouldn't be there. And it would simply be a load instruction to load a constant value. And then this entire block of code wouldn't have any method calls whatsoever. So the takeaway I want you to remember is that one-dimensional arrays in .NET um, the, the intermediate language has optimized instructions for dealing with them. So a code that uses a one-dimensional array will always be faster than code that uses two, three, four, five, or six-dimensional arrays because of the difference in implementation in the .NET runtime. Okay, back to the program. Um, so the next test is um, a comparison of four and four each. So let me show you the code. Um, the Code. The test is here. Here we go. So um, I I create a list 
with one million elements. Um, it's a list of integers. And I fill the list with random numbers. So super simple, one million integers, and every list element is just a random number. And then um, this test uses a for each loop to loop through the list. And this test uses a normal for loop with an uh, integer index variable. And that's it. So let's run those tests and see what happens. And here's the result, 273 milliseconds for the for each loop and 112 for the for loop. So the for loop is roughly twice as fast as the for each loop. So um, to show you why that is happening, let me go back to the intermediate code. Um, we can take a look at the compiled code and see how the loops have been implemented. So here's, here's the test class. Let me scroll down. So that's the constructor. And here is measure test A. And you can see that um, the for each loop uses an enumerator, a generic enumerator to loop through the list. So the first thing you have to do is you have to um, call the list and call the get enumerator method. And that gets you the, the enumerator. And then the enumerator itself has a current property to access the uh, current value of uh, the current element that you're looking at. And there's a move next method that will move the enumerator to the next um, element in the list. And move next is a, you can see it's a Boolean uh, method. It returns bool. And this branch instruction um, jumps, basically jumps back to uh, 12. So it, it loops this bit of code as long as the enumerator uh, returns a value. And as soon as move next returns false, we reach this point and this leave instruction will exit the method. So um, you can see that the for each loop is implemented by using an enumerator class and then repeatedly calling move next and accessing the current property to get the data. So that's a lot more overhead than a simple uh, for loop, which is implemented here. It's this bit of code. You can see that the for loop, um, it doesn't really use any classes at all. The only place where um, a class is being used, where a method call is being used, is here, where I access the um, element in the list. But the loop itself is just this piece of code. So a, a for for loop, uh, it can be implemented with uh, only a few SIL instructions, and it doesn't require any specialized classes. So that's why a for loop is much faster than a for each loop. Now, keep in mind, when you are looping through an array, there's no difference between the two, because the C-sharp compiler is uh, very smart. If you use for each on an array, the compiler will generate a normal for loop behind the scenes. So um, you won't see any difference in performance. But for the more complex collection classes, um, you can see that there is a difference. It's about a factor of two. OK, so moving on. Structs versus classes. Let me show you the code uh, right here. So what I've done is I have declared a simple um, class that contains an X and a Y field, two integer fields, and a constructor to initialize those two fields. I've done the same thing as a struct. So this is basically the exact same thing, but now it's a, uh, it's a, uh, whoops. Uh, hey, there's actually a bug in my code. It's not a struct with a class. Hey, sorry about that. Um, let me quickly fix that then. Let me see if this works. This is the demo effect. There's always something that goes wrong. Um, exit and restart. So I've defined a class with an X and a Y field, and I've defined a struct with an X and a Y field. And then the only thing my code does is um, it fills a list with either classes or structs. So the uh, C test fills a list with structs, the B test fills a list with classes, and the A test fills a list with classes. But look at this, the class has a finalizer. 
so um, when this class gets disposed, the finalizer will be called by the garbage collector. So let's run that code and see what happens. Oops, uh, default iterations. Oops. And so there is the difference. Um, the class with the finalizer takes 246 milliseconds. The normal class takes 111 milliseconds. And the struct takes 6 milliseconds. So that's quite a big difference. Um, the reason for that difference is uh, because of the way that structs and classes are implemented on the heap. When I create a list of classes, this is what the memory will look like. The reference to the list will be on the stack, so it's right here. The list itself is right here on the heap. Uh, the list has a number of elements. Each element is an object reference, so that'll be eight bytes in size. And uh, the reference points to an entirely different location on the heap where the class is stored. So um, if you um, calculate the amount of memory for an um, eight megabyte list, you would actually look at 32 megabytes of heap memory because um, you have to store the list on the heap and you have to store all the different uh, point classes for, for all the data. Now, when this gets garbage collected, there's going to be a load of objects on the heap, not just the list, but also all these individual uh, point classes. And they all need to, ha need to be garbage collected to be disposed. If you use a struct, the memory layout looks like this. So we still have the list reference on the stack pointing to the heap. Um, the list is on the heap, but now the data, the struct, is in line in the list itself. This is the difference between a class and a struct. Structs are stored in line within their containing type, whereas classes are stored separately and the containing type contains a reference. So now the entire struct, uh, it's two integers, so the entire struct fits inside uh, eight bytes, in, inside an eight byte element. So now the entire data structure is only eight megabytes and it's only a single object on the heap. So when the garbage collector has to clean up the memory, it goes to the list, disposes the list and it's done. That's all it needs to do. So in these kinds of scenarios, using structs is extremely lucrative. Um, if you have lists with a large amount of data, the data itself contains of only a few fields, like X and Y or X, Y, Z coordinates. Think of uh, uh, points, vectors, uh, things like that. And you use the um, data for a short amount of time, and then you don't need it anymore. So you only briefly need access to the data. If those three conditions are met, then structs are extremely lucrative to use. And um, finally, the big uh, slowdown uh, in the finalizer is because um, when your classes have a finalizer, the garbage collector needs to call the finalizer one after another to dispose your class, and it does so on a single thread. So uh, if you have one million classes right here on the heap, uh, the garbage collector has to call one million finalizers to get rid of all the data, and that's really going to slow down your code. So uh, and that's why you get this difference in performance. Okay, moving on to uh, copying blocks of data. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a byte array, right here, a byte array of one million bytes, so one megabytes in size, and we're going to copy this entire array into another byte array. So we're just copying a block of memory. So the, the um, most straight away of doing that is simply using a loop and uh, iterating through Right here, iterating through the loop, we are going through every byte in the array and manually copying it into the other array. And um, again, to slow down this test a bit, I repeat this whole thing 500 times. So I'm copying one megabyte of data 500 times. Now, in test B, I do the same thing with pointers. So you can see I use the fixed keywords again to get two pointers to the first element in the buffer. And then I use these source and destination pointer variables to do the copy like this. So I'm here I'm using um, array indexing, and here I'm using byte pointers. Finally, the last method, I use this copy to method. Uh, an array has a uh, copy to method, which will quickly let you copy the array to another array. So now we can see the difference. Um, how slow is this manual process? How much faster is it with pointers? And is there any benefit in using the copy to 
method instead. So let's test that out. Uh, binary copy number five, 500 iterations with the baseline. Dum, dum, dum. Wait for it. And there we go. So the direct copy operation takes 400 milliseconds. When we use pointers, it's only 388 milliseconds. So it's very interesting. Um, using pointers doesn't have that much benefit, actually, when we're working with bytes. The um, SIL implementation, so the intermediate language that the compiler produces, is already so efficient that um, using pointers doesn't really have any added benefit. And this is perfectly in line with with what I told you earlier, that the um, intermediate language runtime is optimized for one-dimensional arrays. So when you're already working with one-dimensional arrays, you don't really need to um, optimize it further with pointers. But look at the copy two method, 32 milliseconds. That's massive, that's 10 times faster. So um, the reason for this is that the copy to method is incredibly optimized. It actually calls into the um, operating system and it calls a low level uh, function for copying a block of memory. So basically the copy to method simply uh, fixes those two blocks of memory on the heap, just like with a fixed keyword, but then it calls an OS function and it says, I've got this block of one megabyte, could you please copy it to this other memory address? And then the operating system does it. Now that is extremely fast. Um, there's no way we can we can go even faster with uh, C-sharp codes. I mean, you can't beat the operating system. So the takeaway here is one-dimensional arrays are already super fast, so you don't really need pointer operations there. But um, if you are simply copying a block of memory, you're not doing anything special with the array values, then the copy to method is the way to go. Because then you allow the operating system to basically just copy this entire block of memory. And that gives you maximum speed, because you're 10 time speed improvement. So that's pretty cool. Okay, the um, next uh, performance test. Now this one is very nice. Um, I'm going to show you a very fast way to instantiate an object. So let me start with the simple code first. So here's my baseline. Instantiating an object means uh, we construct an object. We construct an instance of a certain type. And um, often in, uh, when you have to use reflection, um, you, the type isn't known at compile time. Um, the type that you want to create is only known at runtime. You often get this if you have um, configuration information in an XML file and your code needs to dynamically adapt to whatever is in the configuration file. Or if you use um, something like XAML, um, not actual XAML, but say your own implementation, and you have a complicated data binding expression, something that you, you write out as text. Um, you bind uh, one property to another property, and then you somehow need to turn that into executable code. So these are all scenarios where your code has a string that contains a type, and you need to instantiate an object of that type. So the most straightforward way of doing that is simply using reflection. So um, I have my string right here. You see I'm going to create a string builder. So I take the string, I, I create a type object. So I get the type object of this type. And then I use this line of code, you've probably seen it a couple of times in, uh, in uh, other, other programs, activator.createInstance. And that will instantiate an object of that type. And then this code here is just a sanity check. Um, I look at the object and I check if the type is actually a string builder. So if we see an exception, we know that the code is acting weird. So that's one way of doing it. Now the fastest way of doing it is like this. This is cheating because here, um, I'm actually constructing a string builder. So here the type information is known at compile time. Um, obviously this wouldn't be possible in a normal program, but I'm just adding it here for reference purposes so we can see the difference in performance. So uh, this is compile time instantiation, this is runtime instantiation using reflection, and now I'm going to show you a really cool trick, um, a way to quickly instantiate types using uh, runtime instantiation. And that's this bit of code here. Now all the magic happens here in this getConstructor method. So uh, let's look at that. So here is getConstructor. And what constructor does is it creates a dynamic method. 
Now, dy dynamic methods are super cool. Uh, they were introduced into .NET when uh, link expressions were introduced. You know, with link, you can create a link expression and turn it into an expression tree, and then at a later time, turn that expression tree into executable code and then run that code. Um, behind the scenes, that, that library uses dynamic methods to create new methods on the fly at runtime. So when we instantiate an object in intermediate code, um, it's super simple because you only need two SIL instructions. Actually, you only need one SIL instruction to do it. Um, the instruction is called new object, and the only thing it needs is a uh, reference to a constructor. So um, uh, it's a single SIL instruction, and it will instantiate an object. So what this code does is it creates a new dynamic method and then it uses an intermediate language generator to fill this method with SIL instructions, one after another. So the first instruction that we inject into this method is simply new object. So this will call the constructor of the object that we're trying to create. And then the second instruction is return because we want to return out of the method. And that's it. So um, this dynamic method is returned right here. You can see it's, I return it as a constructor delegate, uh, which I've declared up here. So it, my constructor delegate is simply a, uh, a delegate that describes a method without any parameters that returns an object. So let's run this code and see what happens. Instantiation, one million times, and with a baseline. So here's, here's the difference. So using reflection takes 85 milliseconds, um, which, is, which is not bad. But using my dynamic method takes only 22 milliseconds. So it's really cool. It's four times faster. But now look at this. Compiled code is 19 milliseconds. So there's almost no difference between constructing a dynamic method and letting the compiler construct the method for you, basically. So this trick lets you use um, reflection-like techniques. It, use, it lets you use a form of dynamic programming to create objects at runtime of any type you want at the same performance level of compiled code. Now, this is super important because, um, I mean, I, my career is 20 years long, and um, I have used reflection many, many times in my code projects um, to instantiate objects. And with this trick, I get almost native performance. So there's no need to use activator.create instance anymore. You can simply use a dynamic method. So the takeaway here is please be aware that you can do it this way. You don't need to use classic reflection to create new objects. You can use this, this neat trick to create your own method, uh, inject SIL instructions into that method, and let it do anything you want. And the creating an object is super simple. You only need two SIL instructions. So this whole magic just happens in this block of code. So it's fairly compact. It's a drop-in replacement for activator create instance, and it gives you a massive performance increase. So please be aware that this is, that this is possible. OK, now the final performance um, benchmark I want to show you is um, uh, property access. Because if you think about it, this dynamic method trick is super cool. Um, we can inject any kind of uh, SIL instructions into a new method and make it do anything we want. So could we access a property using a dynamic method? So let's find out. My my property is here. so my code is here. Let me go down to the test methods first. So um, the first thing I do is um, I use classic reflection. So I'm creating a string builder right here. Then I use classic reflection to get a property info uh, instance. And you can see I, I access the type of the string builder and then I access the property called length. So now I have a property info uh, variable. And then to get the value of length, all I need to do is this, pi.getValue. That's it. And then here's a simple sanity check. My name, my full name is exactly 21 characters. So I'm checking that the value really is 21. If not, we'll see an exception. So this is classic reflection. Um, compile time code would look like this. 
So to access the length of the string builder, I simply write sb.length and that's it. So compile time code, this gives us maximum performance. But now dynamic methods. I have a method here called get property getter, which will get me an access to the length getter method of this type. So now getter will point to the property and uh, it will point to the, the internal get method of the property. And then to call it, I can simply do this. So let's see how that works. So here is roughly the same code again. You can see I have my dynamic methods, which I, whoops, wrong one. Ha. You can see I have my dynamic method here, which I um, instantiate. So I'm creating a get value method and I'm injecting SIL instructions into it. And then here are the instructions I'm creating. So the first thing I'm uh, emitting is a SIL instruction called load argument zero. So what this will do is it will load the first argument um, onto the uh, internal SIL execution stack. So the first argument would be this one. Here's my property get delegate, and you can see it's a delegate for a method that accepts a single object parameter and it returns an object return value. So load argument zero will load this value. Then what I am emitting is a call, um, an instance call to the getter uh, function. And the getter is up here. It's the get method of the property that I specified. So there's a tiny bit of classic reflection here to get to the method info of the getter of the property. But from then on, I simply use that variable to emit the call instruction directly. And now um, you might be aware that um, the .NET framework, um, it, it can transparently work with value types and reference types. But if you have a value type and you return it as an object, you have to box it. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm looking at this getter uh, method. And if the return type of the getter is a value type, then I'm emitting an extra box instruction to take this, this, this integer. I mean, we know that the length of a string builder is an integer, so it's going to be a value type. So I'm boxing it into an object. And then here's the return. And that's it. So this is a super compact uh, dynamic method with, um, well, four still instructions, load argument zero, call the getter, box the value type, and return. So four still instructions to perform the access to the property. And then to use it, all I need to do is this. I call this, this getter delegate, I provide the string builder, and it returns me the length. So let's run the code and see what happens. So I'm doing the property access. We're doing, um, what's this, five, five million iterations and with a baseline. Wait for it. And that's the result. So this is extreme. Huh? Um, the classic reflection takes 910 milliseconds. Um, so it's fairly slow. The dynamic method takes 55 milliseconds, 55 milliseconds. So that's, that's pretty awesome. That's um, 10, what is it? 20 times faster, more or less. 910 divided by 55, 16 times faster. So that's quite a speed improvement. Doing it in compiled code is only one millisecond, so that's extremely fast. You can see that um, the delegates that I'm using to run this dynamic uh, code, um, using a delegate, calling a delegate, um, there's a little performance overhead associated with that. When we created the object, um, there wasn't that much difference between doing it in a compile time or doing it with a dynamic delegate. But here you can see that the compiler is able to very quickly access this length property, whereas my um, dynamic method is um, 55 times slower. So that's a big difference. But we're assuming this is a scenario where you can't do compile time code. You don't know the type that you want to work with at compile time. So this option is basically out of the window. So your only choice is classic reflection or using a dynamic method. And this gives you a 16 times performance improvement. 
So the takeaway here, the thing that I want to uh, I want you to remember is using dynamic methods is not that complicated. Uh, you can see my code is fairly compact. I've actually I added the um, setup as well. I'm not using this in my example, but uh, when you download my code and use it, you can play around with the setter as well. But you can see that creating a property getter using dynamic SIL instructions, it's not that much code, it's just this bit. And the SIL instructions to do the work are just this section here. So creating dy dynamic methods, it sounds intimidating, but it's, it's not that complicated actually. And um, it will give your code a massive speed improvement if you use it to replace your classic reflection code. So please be aware that this option is on the table. And that brings me to the end of this webinar. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation, Mark. Um, if you if you would like to summarize uh, the the special coupons that you have for the attendees, I think the, now it's a good time. Okay, um, so let, let me uh, uh, show them to you again. So the coupon to get any of my Udemy courses at a ninety percent discount is post sharp fifteen. So use that code in any Udemy course to get the discount. Um, if you want to spend even less, uh, then go to um, my training.ndfarager.com uh, website. So this is a teachable um, environment. This is my own teachable environment. And there you can take a subscription for $9 a month and that will give you access to everything. And any courses that I create in the future will automatically get added to the subscription. So um, that means that um, roughly once a month you can expect a new course from me and you, you will be enrolled in that course automatically. Finally, if you want the source code that I've just shown you to play around with the code and create some dynamic methods of your own, then just send me an email at mark at and I'll reply and I'll, I'll put the email, I'll, I'll put the source code in, the, in an attachment in the reply and then uh, you can play around with it. So I've used Visual Studio Community Edition um, on OS X. But of course, the code will work in any uh, any Visual, Stu Visual Studio edition, um, and I'm using .NET Core 1.1. But I'm not doing any weird stuff, so you can easily take the code and run it against the classic .NET framework. Um, it will still work. So send me an email. I'll give you the source code. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question about the coupons. Actually, uh, if if they are time limited, they are not time limited. So okay. they will work. They will work indefinitely. Sounds great. Uh, okay, so we have a bunch of questions. Uh, now I would probably move to that. Uh, I will read out the questions out loud and uh, you can answer them. Yep. Okay. So there was a question, uh, which version of .NET are you using? I think you mentioned that, but maybe just to repeat that. Yeah, I'm using .NET Core 1.1. So um, I can show it to you right here. If I go into options, then into the general settings. So this is a .NET Core application version 1.1. Um, I'm using the default C Sharp version, which is version seven. Uh, my code uses tuples, um, and um, there are some tricks here and there. Uh, for example, um, this thing here. You can see I'm declaring my out variable inside the try parse method. So this is like an embedded uh, variable declaration. You can do this in C Sharp seven. So there are a few little tricks here and there scattered through the source code. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, there is a question from Brian and he asks, uh, is there a concern with using string that format as opposed to string builder? Um, good question, great question. Um, the, it depends on how you use it. Uh, string dot format, um, internally, of course, it uses a string builder. So uh, the call to format itself um, will, um, will be pretty efficient, but of course it returns a string. So it all depends on what you're doing with string.format. Um, if, if you take the output and you simply add it to another string and you do that in a tight loop and it's part of the mission critical part of your program, then you are going to see a performance hit. But um, honestly, I use string of formats all over the place in my own code, um, uh, in logging code, in tracing code, uh, output code, and it's all good. So um, don't worry about uh, calling string of formats, but 
if you are looking at a mission critical loop in your code, then do consider removing it. Um, and one final thing, um, if you use um, these kind of strings, I forgot the name, but you know, the ones that start with a dollar and have these embedded um, uh, embedded variables, like right here. Um, this is simply a syntactic sugar. It calls string format behind the scenes. So this is actually a string format call. And again, don't worry about it. Um, just use it whatever you like. But um, in tight loops, mission critical, mission critical code, consider removing it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, another question from Niksha. Is there any difference using dynamic method versus ex expression or lambda expression for reflection? Um, it's pretty much the same, but the dynamic method is slightly faster. Um, I, I read a benchmark, uh, someone else did a benchmark, and they compared all these different ways of creating dynamic expressions. And the dynamic method was the fastest. Um, it's only a slight difference, so if you prefer to, um, to use expressions instead, just go for it. Um, if you want the maximum performance, then use dynamic methods. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Chris. Do you have advice for which of these methods you recommend we look at all the time versus looking for them in the hot path? For example, if something is called once at startup, do you strive for these optimizations in your code? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's fair. Very short answer, but yeah. Uh, the, um, when you have identified the hot path in your code, um, please do take out uh, repetitive calls, repetitive initi uh, instantiations, initializations, and move them outside of loops uh, or outside of the hot path. That's basically step one in optimization. So yeah, yeah, great question, and definitely do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A uh, question from Christian. Looking at the get constructor method regarding string appending, how many strings does it need that the string builder is more efficient than a normal string addition? That's an awesome question. I measured it. The answer is four. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually did this measurement. Um, if you do uh, less than four string concatenations, the string is faster. Uh, because of the overhead of actually creating the string builder. But if you do m four or more, then the string builder is faster, and these two start to deviate really quickly. So um, again, don't religiously remove all normal string concatenations from your code, because it makes your code a lot less readable. Uh, string builder is a nice class, but the append syntax is not very, very, very nice, basically. Um, it's a lot less clear than simply using a plus sign to add two strings together. So three strings or less, absolutely no problem. Use normal strings. More than three, use the string builder. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, question from Kevin. Uh, when working with loops, is the performance loss the same when using link queries? For example, does the for each expression have the same performance loss as a normal for each loop? The um, the fun thing with link is that it always uses an enumerator. So um, if you use for each in link, you get the enumerator code to incrementally step through the expression. And if you try to do it with a classic loop, you still get the enumerator code because link is built on top of enumerators. It's the whole thing is one giant enumerator with, with nested methods on top of that. So um, with link, you will see the slow performance no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Travis. Uh, since dynamic method has been in .NET since the introduction of LinQ, why doesn't the optimized reflection code you demonstrated exist in the reflection library outright as an existing class if the implementation is the same regardless of the code you're pulling? Honestly, I'm not sure. Um, my hunch is that it has to do with backwards compatibility. But uh, it's, it's a good point. Um, you could definitely rewrite the classic reflection code and make it much faster using this methodology. So I think uh, my hunch would be that um, the um, activator.create instance behaves slightly different from a dynamic method. And if they had tried to do this, it would break backwards compatibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, question from Karthik. Uh, can you please suggest any good tools to check performance issues in code? Um, I'm, I have Visual Studio Enterprise in a virtual machine. It has a, it comes with a performance uh, testing tool. Um, that one's pretty amazing. 
So I, I really like the tools that are bundled with Visual Studio. Um, and in fact, those are the only tools I use. I mean, I've, I've demoed all this code using uh, Visual Studio on OS X because it's easier, um, because I don't want to run a performance benchmark inside a virtual machine. But when I'm doing my day-to-day -day programming, I'm using Visual Studio Enterprise in a Windows VM. And um, the tools in there are just great. So I would say start with those. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't have any other recommendations than the, the, the standard Visual Studio stuff. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Prakash. Which is faster, type of or get type method? Uh, <laughs> nice question. <laughs> um, I think type of is faster, but uh, it's a hunch. I'm going to have to check that. Mm -hmm. uh, Another question from Al. Can you tell us a bit about projects where you had used these optimizations? I, um, in the past, I wrote this huge uh, web library, ASP.NET library, where you could declare, you could um, create web pages using a XAML-like syntax. Um, so you could basically just map out your entire web page in HTML. Um, but you could use special binding expressions inside the HTML. So I could put a text box in there and then bind the contents of the text box to a variable in uh, my ASP.NET code. Uh, so this wasn't XAML, it was my own project and I, I was kind of inspired by XAML. Um, and the, the code to parse those data binding expressions use these dynamic methods to speed it up. I started out with classic reflection um, to um, you know, parse this, this parse an expression and then access objects and access properties and get values and it was incredibly slow. So I rewrote the whole thing and used dynamic methods. So any place where you, um, where you are creating expressions based on text data, so not actually code, but something that's stored in a text file. It could be XML or a config file or anything. Any situation where that occurs, um, using dynamic methods is really going to help you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I think we still have time for some more questions. Uh, there is a question from Victor. What's the overhead of string interpolation in C Sharp 7 versus string that format? Um, so string interpolation is the dollar syntax, I think. Huh? Um, the, it's exactly the same. So uh, behind the scenes, string interpolation is string.format. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're not going to see any performance difference between the two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, there's a question from Adil. In the strings test, would string builder perform better if you passed capacity into the constructor? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that is an excellent question. Um, since I didn't initialize my string builder, it gets initialized on the heap with a default size, which I think um, it's, it's 16 bytes, I think, 16 characters, or 32, something like that. And every time when you hit the limit, so when you add characters and the whole thing is full, it doubles in size. And of course, to double it in size, the um, framework has to instantiate a new string builder with twice the size, and then copy all the data over. So it's doing exactly the same thing that the string is doing, but the difference is it happens in doubling. It doesn't happen on every character edition. It only happens when the buffer is full and it has to double. So um, string builder is logarithmically faster than string, but it's still doing this, this instant, instantiate a new thing and copying data over process. So if you instantiate the string builder at maximum size right from the start, and then fill it with data, then um, you never have to expand the buffer. There is enough room on, in memory, and you're simply writing characters one by one directly into that, that area of memory. And that will give you the maximum performance. So yeah, great question. Good observation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So uh, I think this will be it for today's session. There are uh, some more questions uh, which we will cover uh, after the session. Uh, so we will upload the Q&A on the website along with the webinar recording. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining us and uh, huge thanks to Mark for the great presentation. And Mark, if you want to add anything at the end, please feel free. <laughs> well, uh, well I, I think I said pretty much everything I'd like to say. Um, if, you, if you have any performance issues or questions or whatever, I mean, don't hesitate to send me an email. Um, I like to brainstorm about code and optimizing C-sharp code is my hobby. So uh, feel free to reach out.
Okay, great. So thank you very much again and uh, have a nice day, everyone. Bye.